Carlos Thompson is, um, this is, this will embarrass him, so I better say it before he comes out here. There's something I've only seen happen in sketches and in fiction, and that is that when someone enters the room, everybody turns. And in a hotel <laughs> lobby, he came in, and before I saw who had come in, I noticed every face turn, particularly those of the women. And it was like a sketch. It was overdone. It was like a, a director had done it. Including my face? Inclu you weren't there at the time. Yours was turning somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> but it, he is an actor. He certainly looks the part. Uh, I think he has a certain, perhaps, disdain for his acting. He was an actor. Was an actor. Long made ago. What apparently, what seemed to be hundreds of films in various languages. Yes. Uh, more important to him, he's written several novels right. and other books in Spanish as well as English. Uh, the one that particularly fascinated, fascinated me is one that w became a sudden obsession with him. And for two years, day and night, literally, it seemed, uh, he tracked down a fascinating story which resulted in a book called The Assassination of Winston Churchill. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to give American viewers a chance uh, to know him and watch the heads turn. Ladies and gentlemen, Carlos Thompson. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> nice to go. Thank you. How are you, Carlos? Good to see you. Uh, have you said all you had to say? Yes, I... I have to show you something. Come. What is this? <laughs> is this rehearsed? What's happening? <laughs> That's man's lib. <laughs> you mean, you mean you have... Evicted her. She had Carlos. 27 minutes. <laughs> she... <laughs> are, are you, are you going, from, to, are you you going to let him be the man who took Lily Palmer away from the American audience? The only one. Well, I, I'm astounded. You forgot that. Thank you. Is there you any want. possibility that uh, Miss Palmer will be dropping back in on us, perhaps at some uh, point? She may say goodbye. <laughs> but that's, that's colossal nerve, I must say. That's man's lib. You can come back if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> but let's do talk about it. No, no. <laughs> She's known this for 24 years. We can't afford to squander a guest that way. <laughs> Carlos, let me ask you something. Tell you me. cannot capsula encapsulate a book that you've written that long ago, I'm sure. But to quickly get into the subject, the assassination referred to is not of Winston Churchill, but it could have been called by Winston Churchill. No, no, it's it, character assassination. It's what? Character assassination. Aha. Of Winston Churchill. Character assassination, but that word is left out in the... In the well, it was implicit, you know. Yeah. What else? You know he died normally. It was the plane crash in which Colonel Sikorsky, a Polish general... Prime Minister. Colonel, was he, yeah. General and Prime Minister. Yeah, w was killed, and it was rumored in a play by Ralph Hochhuth. Stop me when I mm -hmm. go wrong. Uh, it, it was written in a play uh, that Churchill was the instigator of this assassination of this former friend of his, or at least responsible for it. Uh, what intrigued you about that? What, what hooked you on that? Well, to begin with, when the thing was brought to me by a friend of ours, whom you know, Lawrence Olivia, mm -hmm. came to the house in Switzerland and said, I've got a play to present, which I don't believe in, because I must present a play in which Churchill is but tacitly and implicitly accused of the murder of his great friend. There were great personal friends and allies mm -hmm. in the war against Hitler, uh, Sikorsky. And uh, to make it very short, the author, Hohut, said he had a document in a Swiss bank vault to be open 50, 50 years, 40 years now, mm -hmm. in which he had the blueprint of the murder given him by a man belonging to the British Secret Services. And which implicated Churchill. In which mm -hmm. implication was established. But uh, as Olivia said to me, look, it's very easy. In 50 years' time, we'll all be dead. When they opened that vault, Hohut's children will have made half a million dollars, maybe, with this play and there will be no proof at all to be found, or some meaningless piece of paper. So I still believed that the premise that a great statesman is forced to kill another great statesman, his friend, was valid, mm -hmm. poetically at least. So I set, set out to find out the truth, believing that Hohut was saying the truth. And within weeks I knew that the man is a scoundrel, the whole thing is a hoax, and there's see. nothing to it. You didn't set out to prove he was wrong, but Far came upon it. that. It's in, it's in the book. Uh -huh. and, but once I knew, when I gave Olivia the proof, and I said, don't touch it with a 10-foot fo uh, uh, foot pole, yeah. I knew I couldn't let go. I had to find out why this man lied so much and so deeply, because before that, he wrote a play called The Deputy, about the Pope Pius XII, That's right. where he accused him of being cahoots with Hitler to kill the Jews, to slaughter the Jews. Yes. You see? 
And although I do believe the Pope didn't do enough to save them, it's absurd to imagine that he was in cahoots with Hitler to slaughter as many as they could and get rid of the Jews. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went on for two years, as you said before, uh, and the result of these 500 pages of total proof disavowing this, which is only important because we all have read history and studied history, and we all know that at least half of the history we read is not true. Mm -hmm. Has been written by the families of the culprits, by the families of the victims, by political sympathizers and so forth. Now, if I hadn't done that, which I did only as a public service, in 50 years' time, in 100 years' time, people would have said, ah, but Churchill, there was that play written by, once by a German who was a hu great humanist mm -hmm. who said he murdered Sikorsky. And they would have tarnished this man's image falsely without any proofs. And That's said would purpose. have faded into proved and eventually it would have... As it uh, always does. Yeah. You know, and becomes a fait accompli and, and people accept it. That was the, the whole idea. I mean, yeah. the book, if I may just finish the subject and sure. bore you with it, is this. Uh, my intention is that the book goes beyond Churchill and beyond Hochhut to one point which touches us all, which is intellectual integrity. Mm -hmm. If writers don't say the truth, who is going to say it? Mm -hmm. The military can't, for reasons we know, we know. The church can't say it. The businessman can't say it. Well, who else can say it? The artists. Presumably. Only the artists and the mm -hmm. writers in terms of the written word. So I think that we should go to any extreme to find the truth of things, the pure truth, untarnished. That's and this all. obsessed you for two years and for you I never... I traveled two years day and night. I think I saw Lily seven times in two years. That but is I, an understanding marriage, isn't it? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. But she, she was brought up in the same kind of school I was brought up, you know, a sort of stern, pragmatic idealism, not dreamy idealism. I'm mm -hmm. not an idealist. I'm a man of action. I refuse to be called an idealist, because idealists usually louse up the show with dreams. Yes. You know? <laughs> and uh, am I, do I misremember this now? I have wanted to read this book for a very long time, and I didn't know it was now. available in America. It, it, I mean, now. Is it, is it still? It, uh, it, it is now, yes. Yeah. Um, did you or did you not find the, at least one man who was supposed to have been dead? Did you find the pilot who flew the plane? The pilot who survived and Hohut had given to the world in press conferences in Berlin and other places, the international press, mm -hmm. that he had been knifed to death in a brawl in a Ch Ch Chicago bar by the British Secret Service. And this that was established and finished. Prahal had been killed by knife in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So when I came nearer and nearer to the thing, and I was told, if he's alive, he's in California somewhere. Mm -hmm. I went to Chicago first, and I went through all the cemeteries all the files of the FBI, CIA, and all the police files. And I only found two Prahals, one a woman of 86 and a man of 79, dead of pneumonia. Wow. You see? So then I knew he wasn't dead in Chicago. So when yeah. I went to California, by mere chance, I was able to find out that he lives in Palo Alto. And I found him. And there is an enormous long chapter on all the things he has to say. What was your first clue that he might be alive? The Do first clue was a an item published in, an, in a British newspaper by a man whose name I didn't know. And you know, mm -hmm. you may distrust these things when you see them saying he had met Prahal in California and spoken to him. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's all the, I knew. The world is so full of stories of people who are alive that are supposed to be dead and it usually turns out they are dead that the odds against your having turned him up were, I would think would have been discouraged. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you if I may just shortly because it's amusing. When I went to see him, I got his address. I was convinced for a moment he may be a plant Ah. He may not be the true Prahal because he refused to see anyone. He refused to speak. Mm -hmm. He said nothing. You couldn't get to the man. And the chances were that he could be a plant by the Germans because Sikorsky could have been killed by the Germans or by the Russians. Mm -hmm. So I went blind one evening and rang his bell. But I'd been studying his photograph under a magnifying glass for weeks. Yeah. And I knew exactly where the air hung in what part of the face, which you can't change with facial operations. And I, Where the, the way the air related to the cheek the, the and The relation so on. of the air to the nose and so forth. You have to deform a face totally and too much, and then you can see it's been tampered with a knife. How did you know that? Were you in secret service? No, I, no I, I used to study when I, when I was a young man. Um, what's the word? Physiognomy? No, well, use it, but that's not the, the that's word. That's not it, it's but it'll not do. And um, so I made a study of the face in great detail. Yeah. And... I had one photograph of a man standing on the wing, wing of his fighter plane, leaning towards the cockpit, in such a way that the light cut right behind the air here. Mm -hmm. And all the features were as I needed them to be, to see as he was. And when I got to his place, he was getting out of his car in the night, but the lights of his car were behind him, and he stood exactly as in the <laughs> all day. 
And he said his great tragic quality in his writing came from the great clown in, in his making. Mm -hmm. He said, he, of course he became sad three months before he died. Who doesn't? You know, when he heard he was dying of TB, he got a bit depressed. Yes. But that famous photograph, which is in mostly all the editions of Kafka's eyebrows like that, which mm -hmm. is Kafka being, as I can be, and I hope you're not, sort of, you know, doing it for the camera, this kind of thing we're going to photograph you, but it meant, 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 meant nothing. Yeah. That was not the man at all. It's probably like when I met, first met Ingmar, Ingmar Bergman, I thought this will probably be the gloomiest interview I will ever have. And Bergman was, uh, you talk about Kafka and his practical jokes, Bergman had a cat pistol. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people think this is crazy.